Okay, right. Um, so here we are for the December Q&A. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to get stuck into the questions. But before that, I just wanted to take a moment to say um, thank you to you guys. <laughs> this is a bit strange. But um, yeah, and it, just the growth of the channel and you you guys, all your support in the comments, the the questions you you pose, the, the, the likes and all that kind of stuff. It's just really... It's just really nice. It's really humbling. And I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. And um, yeah, I I, just, I I fully intend to keep doing this and I fully intend to grow the channel and try and give you guys quality information. So um, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you um, for the support because it, it genuinely means a lot. Like, it's great. Like uh, I, I genuinely appreciate it. You are giving me your time to, to view my uh, content as much as I'm giving you my time to give you my content. It's, it's nice. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, so, <laughs> with that said, we will crack on with the questions. I'm going to start with questions from Instagram, and we'll go for about half an hour, and then we'll take the rest up the next day. So, starting with this first question from Devrim. Devrim Karadak on Instagram, um, what to do when you constantly get injured outside of the gym? Like waking up with pains and walking, but rarely in the gym. So, Devrim's question is, is saying, well, he gets injured and gets aches and pains outside the gym but very much not so much in the gym, which is interesting. So in the gym, he's good. Outside the gym, he's getting aches and pains. There's a few ways we can handle this. Okay, the first thing that I would look at is, here's what I've, this is a very unscientific thing that I've just as my own experience with dealing with clients. The people who get seem to get injured the most tend to not have the greatest handle on things outside the gym. So let's look at a few major factors. The first one is diet. And you know what? I, on that note, I often feel like, would I have had more longevity had I had a better diet when I was younger? And I often think that. And when I look at people who are getting injured constantly, uh, like friends of mine or whatever, or if I look at clients who are slightly more injury prone, I think, what is it about it? What are the commonalities? And over the years, this is like the average that I've seen. I've seen on average their diets not to be the best. Now, this is not true for everyone, okay? It's not true for everyone. There are exceptions. There are other things that are going on. Some people are just injury prone, just they're born injury prone, you know? But first thing I look at is, or I have seen anyway, as a commonality is diet. Now, if we look at like some of the things we should be getting in into our diets, I think, I, I, I think fruit and vegetable intake is important and that's one to start with. So, Months ago, I did a video on um, optimum fruit and vegetable intake. And I said, I was sharing the results of a meta-analysis uh, coming out of Portugal in 2001, I think it was. Um, but anyway, it said, it showed that the minimum target for fruits and vegetables per day should be about 800 grams to prevent illnesses and disease as you get older. Now, obviously we're not talking about illnesses and disease. We're talking about, you know, um, uh, injuries and stuff, but I think it's still relevant. So 800 grams per day. Now, if you had asked a 22 year old Faz, if he was having 800 grams of fruit and veg per day, I mean, I would have been happy just getting an apple in a day. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was not getting anywhere close to that amount of fruit and veg in. So nowadays, like a kilo of fruit and veg for me is easy. Like that's a standard day. Um, and I, I dare say I have less aches and pains now than I did when I was sort of in my early 30s. Perhaps that's also due to the fact that I'm not training as, as, as heavy, but I don't know. Either way, I think something that I've seen anecdotally anyway, just as a coach, is that there seems to be a gap with diet and fruit and veg is certainly one of the things. The second thing I would say is protein intake, but most young guys don't tend to lack protein. Like if you tell them, look, you've got to get your protein up to 180 grams or 150 grams, like great, cool. Slam a few shakes and off they go. Fruit and veg is different though. So fruit and veg is something I would look at just for the purposes of like reducing inflammation in your body, stuff like that. It's not something which is going to negatively impact your health as a kid. Uh, sorry, I say as a kid, I don't mean that in a condescending way, but like, you, you know, in your 20s, not the right thing to say, not kid. I, I mean, a young adult. It's not something that's going to affect you as a young adult, but later in your life, it probably, you're going to feel the effect more. So yeah, I would say um, fruit and veg is very important. Protein intake, sure, get your protein up to a good range. So I think that's important. Second thing I would say is cardiovascular fitness. This is something I'm a big believer in now and it's something I get all my clients to do. I like them all to do some kind of hard conditioning. Yeah, now whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're thin, whether you're, whether you're trying to lose weight, whatever the situation is, I think hard conditioning is a good idea. 
and uh, I would say, like, while you've all seen this sort of stereotype of, hey, do 10K steps a day and all that stuff, right? That's fine. Like, that's great. It's good to stay active. But I also think a bit of intense work is quite good just to get the heart rate up. I think it's quite important. And I found that's another thing which helps people just be more ready for life, I guess is a way to put it. I just seen, I've seen people who, there's a commonality. When people are in very good cardiovascular fitness, they have a good diet with lots of fruit and veg. And the last thing I'm about to mention, sleep, it, they tend to be quite robust. I mean, we're not even into the training thing yet, but to cover the last one, sleep. Are you consistently sleeping a good seven or eight hours? It's a lot. Like, I know for me, I, I need at least seven. Like, I don't operate well on six. So you'll know your own individual threshold if you're honest with yourself. And I'll just say, like, when you again, when you're in your early 20s, err, err on the side of more sleep because you might not feel the effects of bad sleep day by day, but it might be working away in the background, causing you to be more injured or have more aches and pains. I've said this loads of times, guys. When you're younger, your body is robust enough that you have to look for different signs. So I, I might say... <laughs> I've got an aches and pain, not sleeping very well. You guys might be like, well, I'm fine. But then wham, get an injury. You got to look back and say, okay, what was I doing? Your body is more robust when you're younger, but it will still show you signs. So I said with regards to deloads before, um, younger guys, they tend not to get the aches and pains. They just tend to get ill. You know, the immune system gets compromised. So look out for your signs. So, and this might be one of them, that something's going wrong, Devon. So yeah, look for the big, big three. Sleep, food, um, and yes, stress, I guess, is another one. So think about those things. Um, now, in terms of your actual programming, that's the last thing to look at as well. That might be a problem. And what I'd do is I'd encourage you to maybe um, DM me on Instagram, you know, with, with what you're doing. Obviously, I've got a couple, a few programs that I run, that I have available on my website. Um, they're cheap, you know. I've just tagged a makeshift price on them they're cheap but they at least give you some direction if you can't afford afford coaching or you don't want coaching they at least give you some direction so the wizard uh, is quite popular because it's an undulating periodization very bodybuilding focused one um there's the the berserker which is more for powerlifting so either of those are fine at least they give you some information about periodization about how to do things in a, in a more structured way and, and manage your volume totals so perhaps look at your training and just see what you're doing there and if there's some structure all right next question is from amanda p and it's how to return to lifting after being sick for over a week good question now here's what i normally said i actually had a client just come back from covid and he was off for two weeks and so normally what we do is on a on a heavy day we would come in and we would do a sort of a daily max and then do back off single back off work back off fives based on that daily max so he said, well, what should I do? Like I've been ill, you know, should I go back in on a heavy day or medium day or light day or what do I do? And so I said, go back in on a heavy day. And the reason I said that is if he goes back in and just tests to see where he's at, he can work up to a comfortable single, see where he's at and base his back off work on that. Now, the idea was to do a comfortable single, not an eye bleeding, nose bleeding single. But if you work up to a reasonable weight, just to see where you're at, you can base the rest of your session on that. So like with my client, Mark, uh, he, um, he did a daily max on a, a variation of a press, a variation of a deadlift and a variation of a, of a pull-up. And then he based his back offsets on that. And that elite, at least allows him to see where he's at. Now, let's say Mark's original weight was 100 kilos in the press variation, but he comes in and 80 feels hard. Okay, great. Do your back off work at 60. At least then you know where you're at for the session. You can do your back off work. And this is what I say to people. People tend to be afraid of like maxes and no one's telling you to do a max. Like <laughs> don't do a friggin' max. Don't try and don't have a pre preconception about what you want to lift. Work up slowly, see what feels good and then base your work off that. So then there's no guesswork involved. You know where you're at. You can at least do figure out the rest of your week based on that and then try and improve that over the course of the next two or three weeks to get back to your where you were. So it just so happened with Mark, he was actually able to go right back into it and it was, he was fine. He just copied the same weights he did before his break and he was okay. For somebody else who maybe their illness affects them more, they might come in a little bit lighter. Great. Okay. So I'd say with that, that's kind of what I would say, get an idea for where you are based on a decent single and then just base 
your effort on that. Like if you're going in, these singles feel awful. Back off. Like if you normally squat two plates aside and you get up to a plate aside and it just feels horrendous, like your knees feel terrible, your back feels terrible, everything feels horrible, back off. Okay, go back to maybe half a plate aside, do some reps on that. And at least then you know where you're at and you can build from there. If you're in pain as you're warming up, that is not a good sign. It means you are not ready. So use that as a gauge. Okay. All right, next question is from Jason. Um, Jason uh, is, is a client of mine. Uh, so, hey, Jason, what's your opinion on Greg Doucette's anabolic recipes and how it's basically people eating low calorie, high protein, hyper palatable foods like protein donuts, pancakes, ice cream, and so on? Does it look sustainable for someone long term or is it only for short term gratification? It's a good question. Uh, it's a it's a valid question. It's a fair question. Now, um, just going to preface this with I, I think Greg's got a lot of good information. I think Greg's got a lot of good information out there. I, you know, I know he, he comes under fire quite a lot, but um, he's got a lot of good info out there. I think out of all the mainstream guys, he's he's got some good info. So, you know, it, he's yeah. I am I am subscribed to him. I don't watch much of his stuff, but um, I think he's got some decent info. So, anyway, just my experience. I, my experience based on his recipes, I've had a few clients who have really prized his recipes, who have really been very impressed by some of the stuff he's put out and have tried to fit that into their diet. I've had people have varying success. So with one client, Steve, um, last year, I think it was, um, he, we were trying to get him to do a maintenance phase. So he was coming out of this period of time where he'd been cutting and during his cut phase, he was doing a lot more of the type of recipes which I would recommend, which is very fruit and vegetable focused, very meat focused, you know, so a very filling diet, a very satiating diet. And he decided to have his breakfast as those anabolic, um, the anabolic toast. Every time he had the anabolic toast, though, he just found his appetite skyrocketed over the course of the day. You know, I don't know what it was about. I have my suspicions that if you have that much sweet stuff at the beginning of the day, it primes you to eat more later on. Like, yeah, it's supposed to be quite filling, but for a lot of people, like spiking your glucose that early in the day, let's say if you're a bit older, like Steve was, you don't, and your body doesn't have the best glucose control because he had previously been overweight. Perhaps that's not a very good thing for your appetite. Ultimately, I think you're probably going to have to experiment with yourself and see if it works or not. I think the general idea is good, like have lots of, you know, um, filling foods. And certainly having a French, anabolic French toast is better than just having French toast or, you know, cereal for breakfast, right? But uh, I think for certain populations, it might actually continue to spike their appetite rather than be the solution that they're looking for. And certainly for Steve, it was. Someone else might be watching this and going, yeah, I had his, you know, ice cream and it was great and it was very filling. Cool. From my experience, it's not something I can do on a regular basis. It just seems to spike my appetite. Maybe it's because I'm a bit older. Maybe it's because I don't have the best glucose control. I don't know. Um, I also saw a study um, linked on examine.com, which said that people who are a bit older and tend to have worse glucose control, they, their bodies, their brains specifically, don't run as well on glucose and they tend to run better on ketones. So if you're metabolically flexible, that tends to be better um, when you're older, not something you have to worry about when you're younger. And again, Steve was an older client. So from that angle, I think ultimately you have to try it out for yourself and see if it does spike your hunger. Another way that I focus on this kind of stuff with diet clients is some, sometimes a lot of times my older diet clients, I tend to break things up in terms of, okay, we've established what foods are, you know, um, reasonable to use on a regular basis. Let's try and find your individual list of foods which are appetite stimulating versus those which are appetite suppressing. It's quite a nice way to look at things because, yeah, I mean, and that list will change over time. But like I know, for example, broccoli and cauliflower are very appetite suppressing. They're very appetite satiating. I know for me, um, large bolus of carbs tends to be very appetite stimulating. So though that's my, that's me though, you know, I'm a 40 year old guy who was previously um, quite heavy. <laughs> and for the record, I'm not fat, I'm fluffy. <laughs> to put it politely. So, so uh, that's me, you know, um, you guys will have you, and I'll encourage you to build your own lists of 
okay, what's, and like I always do with training as well, try and find what trends are in your training, try and find what trends are in your diet, rather than say, okay, you know, this is a rule for everyone, because you can't do that. The more I coach people, I realize you can't do that. You know, everyone's an individual, really, uh, with so many factors, you know, there are, there are broad trends, but in general, everyone's you know, an individual. So what's normal for your diet might look very different to what's normal for somebody else's diet. So ultimately, Jason, the answer to the question is, I've had a range of experience with it, both good and bad. I think ultimately you're going to have to try things out for yourself and form your own diet rules, just like you and I are doing with your diet. So, right. Um, so we'll cover this question from B Monty. B Monty is another regular to the, uh, to the Q&A. So thank you for the question. Hello, Faz. I've been doing PPL in some format for nearly the entire time. I've been consistent in the gym, two years. And I'm now switching to PPL upper lower hybrid five days a week for more overall frequency after doing three on one off this last bulk cut phase. Okay. Any practical recommendations for condensing one of the push and pull sessions into a single upper? Okay. Also for further context, the push opens with overhead press and dumbbell variation and the pull opens with barbell rows and weighted pulls greatly appreciate it. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I would say if the push opens with overhead press and dumbbell variations, I would say your upper body should probably open with a horizontal push. So maybe some kind of bench press or dumbbell bench press would be a good idea or weighted dip even if you if your shoulders can cope with it. Um, and the pull up is the barbell rows and weighted pull ups. Yeah. So maybe flip that. Have your upper body day be something like a vertical, uh, sorry, a horizontal push with some sort of vertical pull. That's maybe not a bad idea. I would say though, um, I'm not so sure about five day programs for naturals. Um, I quite like having a cap of four days for naturals. I have, I do have some naturals on five days, um, but that's their specific request because they want to work out that long. They prefer that. But if it, given my choice, I tend not to these days. It just tends to lead to burnout. What I would like is I think you should be a bit more well-rounded. Um, not saying you're not, but that wasn't supposed to be a dig. <laughs> but um, I think there are other things you could do to benefit your overall progress. So like conditioning. It's something I'm going to make a video about at some point because I've, I've got some notes written on about it somewhere on the computer. But uh, this idea that you can be a bit more well-rounded, it actually might support your strength and muscle development a lot better than just doing more and more days in the gym. Because I've been down that road as well of just saying, okay, I'm going to do more and more in the gym, more and more in the gym. And ever since I started running, I've realized like, man, I've really missed like some cardiovascular conditioning. This has been a lot better for me. So one thing I get my clients to do a lot more of these days is cardiovascular conditioning. So yeah, one thing I, I've, I've, I think is quite useful for um, people is to start to do some sort of conditioning and maybe have a day for conditioning. If you do want to be in the gym five days a week, maybe have something like an upper lower and do a conditioning day. You'd be surprised at how much that conditioning day actually can give you if you set it up right. So if you set it up with doing some exercises which are designed to support your weak areas, so like dips, pull-ups, um, box jumps, uh, step-ups, inverted rows, handstand push-ups, if you can do them, do them in like a circuit and add them together with whole body cardio exercises. You know, your typical stuff like burpees, mountain climbers, uh, sled drags, if you have access to those, slam balls, wall balls, bodyweight squats even. They're really easy, so you can use them as GPP. Um, I would like to see you set up something like that. I mean, I'll tell you what I did uh, the other day, um, and I just tried it. It's an RX version of a CrossFit thing. Okay, don't shoot me down. <laughs> This cross, uh, so I did an RX version of a CrossFit, which was um, half an hour and every minute on the minute. And I did um, three pull-ups, six push-ups and nine bodyweight squats. And I did that every minute on the minute for 30 minutes. It was all right. By about the 25th minute, it was getting really hard, you know? So, but that ends up me doing on my off day, I did, what is that? Like 90 push-ups. I think if I got the math right, 90 push-ups, 180, no, sorry, 90 pull-ups, 180 push-ups, and 270 squats. So it adds something to the weekly volume, which is pretty cool, but it, it got me gassed. I, I was as gassed in that session. I was sweating as I would be on a run. So um, I would encourage you to do something more like that. So your, your, 
you're giving your body, um, you're, you're just being more holistic and maybe start going for a run too, you know. Follow my running for a meatheads program that I've got on YouTube. So something like that, so it's a bit more holistic. But um, hopefully that was useful, B Monty. And hopefully I answered the question there. But as I say, when it comes to setting up your days, if you are going to go ahead with a five-day plan, alternate what you start with. So alternate the push with the pull. Uh, sorry, alternate the vertical with the horizontal and, and, and vice versa. But um, I would encourage you to go with for a four-day plan and just ask you to do something additional in the other days, like running and, and calisthenics slash, you know, hit cardio, Metcon type of stuff, you know, crossfit stuff. Nothing wrong with CrossFit. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> this is a great question. Um, so, yeah, this, this question was um, Reps for Rich. Um, Reps for Rich is one of my clients as well, Kishan. If you could memeable fitness icon, if you could choose, I guess he meant to say, if you could choose a memeable fitness icon to train with, who would it be? Would it be Grizzly, Rich, Zs, or somebody else? <laughs> I, um, yeah, man, this is a good one, isn't it? Um, I get, I'd probably choose uh, Grizzly, actually, because uh, I find him fascinating. I think it'd be great. Uh, <laughs> Grizzly reminds me of a lot of my old powerlifting friends. That's why I'd probably go for him, because I have a number of powerlifting friends in, in my hometown that I used to train with in, as part of a powerlifting group who are a lot like Grizzly <laughs> and would, would communicate in just random, angry screams. <laughs> And, and Pat slaps on your back. And I imagine it would be a lot like a trip down memory lane with, with Grizzly. So uh, I, <laughs> I wish I could get you some of you guys to, to meet some of my old powerlifting buddies, but they're very much like, like Grizzly. It's, the, the stereotype is real. Let me, just, let me just say that. Okay. This next question from, was from Kalin Drashkov. Kalin is absolutely yoked out of his mind. So firstly, congratulations, yeah, Kalin, on your physique. Uh, is, and his question is, is training to failure bad for maximum strength gains? Mm. Now, he's written that specifically strength gains. Potentially. Yeah, potentially it is. You'll find most powerlifters generally don't train to failure um, on the actual powerlifts. So, yeah, I mean, AMRAPs and stuff like that generally aren't programmed in for maximum strength. Hypertrophy it's a different matter. You know, you get your reps, you get your stimulation. But for strength, form and practice and repetition is perfect you know repetition 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 in perfect form train to failure tends to lead to less than perfect form um depending on how it's done how deep into failure are you going because i think we have to identify what is failure all that stuff but in general it's not something that's done in most piloting routines that we see so for strength all out strength i would probably err on the side of more work with slightly away from failure maybe something like you know, one or two RIR or on the RPE scale, you know, seven, eight, nine, whatever, seven or eight, I guess, rather than train to failure and just make that up with more sets, more volume. Yeah, for purely for strength, I think that's probably going to be a better approach. Um, if you look at some of the, the more popular strength programs, in, like my Berserker program, you're working up to a daily max and then you're doing sets and reps. You're generally not encouraged to go to failure on those sets and reps because you have a relatively high frequency on the big lifts. And if you look at, say, I don't know, um, West Side conjugate style, you're generally not going to failure on the actual lifts themselves. You might fail on the maximum effort lift, but even that has since been retracted from Louis. He doesn't have people going to an actual fail as often. And if you look at guys like Matt Wenning, who have taken the West Side system and made it their own, they're generally not going to failure. They're discouraging people from doing that these days to keep one in the tank. Just aim for progress, don't aim for failure. And if you look at guys, who else do I regularly follow and take information from? Uh, not many, to be honest. But I mean, if you go back to Shaco, Shaco is a guy I read a lot about. Again, he, he tends to avoid failure on the main lifts and the variations. So from my own experience, it's not something that people tend to do. And from my own powerlifting years, it's not something that I tend to do on the main lifts so for strength i think it has to be mediated generally go to failure you know feel free to go to failure on your assistance lifts your variations your accessory lifts 
just be aware of the toll it takes on your whole recovery. That's all. Like, I'm not one of those guys who's who's like a fear monger about train to failure. Like, sometimes it happens, you know, and it's not going to just ruin you for the rest of the week. <laughs> I had a conversation with a guy on Instagram once, and he was talking about this. And he just, he was adamant at saying that train to failure just ruins you for the rest of your workout. And it just ruins the rest of your day. I, honestly, I'm not even exaggerating. That's what he said. Let the Lord's light shine upon you. Feel the spirit. Let it out. Horrible, horrible things are going to happen. And they're going to happen to you, and you, and you, and you. <gasps> oh, Nelly. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, bro, you have really drunk the Kool-Aid. Like, that is not what happens like do you even train to failure you know it's just not that bad so but i just it's just not something i would encourage people to do on a regular basis like train hard train to the point where you know if you trained any further you'd have to maybe alter your form or whatever but training to that gut-wrenching point of failure where you've you've forced things out maybe a spotter's helped you you've you've actually failed yeah you know it's debatable how much that's going to actually do for you relative to just racking the bar, taking a decent rest period, going and going again, adding up the volume that way. I think I think you've got to establish a good level of intensity, sure. But above and beyond that, the volume really decides how much you grow. The tricky thing is, and this is where the conversation gets a bit convoluted, um, Callan, and I apologize for going on and on, but the tricky thing is this, if you start telling people, look, volume is the main, uh, the volume is the main driver of hypertrophy. If you start telling people that, well, you know what happens. The next thing happens, people start doing 25 sets of muscle group per week and train like, just just don't train very hard. So I've said in the past, you know, volume isn't the main, the main driver for hypertrophy and I still believe that it's not. Like tension is the, is the driver of hypertrophy. So when you're discussing these things about training to failure or not, you really have to take the whole discussion into play because you can, you can start to say things irresponsibly. Like you can say, look, you know, just if you're trying to encourage people to go harder, you can say train to failure all the time, great. But then some people are gonna do well on that advice because they might not train hard and they might have been trying to do 30 sets to failure per week. And so you get them to train hard, it's gonna start to mediate their volume and start to get them better gains. But then you say that to another guy and this guy is like, he's got inner demons, you know? <laughs> this, this is the guy, this is the one guy out of the thousand that you speak to who's going to absolutely literally train like he's possessed. And he's going to be in the squat rack doing 20 rep squats to failure until he literally collapses on the pins and he's going to hurt his back or whatever else or just ruin himself for the week. So you've got to be very, very careful with your advice if you're speaking to a lot of people. So train to failure, I still think like you've got to train really hard. But once you've established that high level of intensity, then play around with the volume and see what you can recover from. And, you know, work on your other factors like nutrition, sleep, stress to allow you to do more. Um, I just think it's a very, fr the more I coach people, the more I speak to people on YouTube, I think it's, it's, a, it's a discussion which is fraught with problems as a content producer because you have to be very, very careful with the advice you give because what is seemingly great advice for one person to go, hey, train to failure, train harder, because that's been on your mind recently and you've been at the gym and you've, been seen, you've seen people train like, you know. Train like pussies. Train really easy. Like a pussy. Then for another person, that could be the exact opposite because they're already training too hard. So I think with regards to the argument about train to failure, just one more, to once more to confirm what I'm saying. Get to a good level of training intensity, a high level of training intensity. And every now and again, you might want to train to failure just to establish that you are training hard enough. And that's when then volume can be played around with. So that's um, my answer. I hope, you, you, hope that made sense. Right, guys, we're going to call it there for today. It's the first half an hour. And um, we'll pick up on this next time. But hopefully you guys found that useful and interesting. And I will speak to you all in the next one. Have a great day.